I hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you next time for another episode of Krakenology. I need a break. Hmm. Bows not included. Hey Jessica. Yes, Johnny. I was thinking we've been together for a while now. Yes, and I've never been so happy in my entire life. Trist is one thing I wanted to talk to you about. What, honey? I would like to ask you your consent to use my spoon-shaped penis huh? arm to put a sack full of sperm inside your head. Oh, Johnny, sweetheart. I was hoping you'd ask. Of course you can. Come here, make me laugh. Wait a minute, what? Oh, I get it. I have to make a video about cephalopod reproduction now. Let's do it. Cephalopod reproduction. And I know what you're thinking. Tentacles, sex, well, not the most educational combination of words in the history of internet. And you know what I mean. And if you don't know, just don't Google it. Trust me, cephalopod reproduction can be very interesting. Some scientists have spent their entire career trying to elucidate the mysteries surrounding it. Of course, I cannot teach you everything that is not about cephalopod reproduction in one single video. But what I want to do here is at least trying to talk about some of the fascinating aspects of cephalopod reproduction that I find interesting. There are different types of reproductive strategies. Gonochorism, hermaphroditism or asexual reproduction. Gonochorism is when an individual only have one sex and doesn't change it during its lifetime. Hermaphroditism is when one individual produces both male and female gametes, simultaneously or sequentially, which means that the individual has to change sex during its lifetime. Concerning cephalopods, as far as we know, they are gonochoric, so they can be either male or female and that's it. So how is sex determined in cephalopods? As you know, humans, who are also gonochoric, have their sex determined by a pair of sexual chromosomes, XX for female and XY for male. Sometimes sex can also be determined by environmental factors. That's the case for all crocodilians, for example. In fact, a slight change in the temperature of incubation of the eggs can have big consequences on the sex ratio. Concerning cephalopods, their genome didn't seem to show evident differences between male and female, at least at the chromosomal level. And we also don't know if their sex can be determined by environmental factors. So can we at least see any morphological difference between male and female? The short answer is yes, but it really depends on the species. Some cephalopods do show extreme sexual dimorphism. It's the case for the Argonaut, for example, which is an octopus that secretes its own shell. The size of the male Argonaut is around 5 to 10% the size of the female. So it's pretty easy to differentiate them. But the problem is that you have to find the male. The shell secreting female has been known for millennia, but the teeny tiny male has only been discovered in the 19th century. And what's interesting here is that the penis of the male was discovered before the male itself. Let me explain. So what I call the penis is technically not the penis. It's a specialized mating arm that the male uses to pass the sperm to the female. So now imagine for a second, your arm has evolved into a spoon-shaped penis. And you have to use that to transfer a sac full of sperm called spermatophore inside the head of the female. What I find fascinating about this specialized mating spoon-shaped penis arm is its particular name. Back in the 19th century, the naturalist Georges Cuvier found what he thought 
was a parasitic worm inside the body of a female Argonaut. He called it Hectocotylus, which means a hundred suckers, and he really believed he just found a new species of worm. Turned out that was only the penis of a male Argonaut, which broke off and remained inside the female. The Hectocotylus is actually 10 times as long as the body of the male Argonaut. I just found a new species of worm. One, two, three, four, five, a hundred. I'm gonna call it. Can I have that back, please? Hmm. Aren't you an Argonaut? Yes, and that is my penis. Oh. Ugh. Isn't this supposed to be 10 times the size of your... GIVE IT BACK TO ME! Not only the ectocotylus is helpful to differentiate male and female, as its structure is species-specific, it can really help into differentiating one species from the other. Sometimes its shape and length are different from other arms, and the suckers on the ectocotylus can be smaller or absent. Before copulation itself, some cephalopods show complex courtship behavior. As I understand it, this courtship behavior is more frequent in decapods, like cuttlefish or squids, and less in octopuses. Octopuses are terrible at flirting. The giant Australian cuttlefish, Sepia apama, gathers annually in massive mating aggregations, where up to 170,000 cuttlefish meet to spawn. The males are usually bigger than the females, twice as big. They also have a big pair of fourth arms. The sex ratio averaged four males to one female, so the males have to be smart in order to increase their chances to mate. And this is especially true for the small males, which are too small to fight the big males. Big males pair with females and they guard them. The small males wait patiently for EPC, or extra pair copulation. The small males use three strategies. 1. Open stealth. The small male waits until the big male is distracted. 2. Hidden stealth. The small males wait under a rock until a female comes by looking for a place to lay her eggs. And 3. Female mimicry. The small male adopts the appearance of a female in order to gain access to a guarded female. Some squids and cuttlefish use simultaneous dual signaling. As you know, cephalopods can change their appearance in a fraction of a second, thanks to a set of organs called chromatophore. Some species use that in order to show a normal pattern on the side of their body that is facing the female, and at the same time showing an aggressive pattern on the side of their body facing rival males. During copulation, the male uses the ectocotylus to acquire the spermatophore and passes it to the female. But how does it work exactly? Let's ask the experts. So if mating is happening in a parallel position like this, the sperm is then stored inside the mantle of the female. If mating is happening in a mouth-to-mouth -mouth position, like this, well, um, the sperm is stored in a seminal receptacle close to the mouth. The female can store the sperm for several months before using it. Are we, are we done yet? The life of a semelparous organism is characterized by one single event of reproduction. On the opposite, an heteroporous organism goes through multiple cycles of reproduction during its lifetime. So what about cephalopods? Here again, it really depends on the species, but also if we're talking about the male or the female. But at least to give you one example, most octopuses are semelparous. After mating, the male becomes senescent and dies, if the female didn't eat it first. And yes, that can happen. After mating, the female lay eggs and all she does is just taking care of them until her last breath. And sometimes she doesn't even eat in that period. Cephalopod eggs can have different size, shape and color, but most of them are enclosed within a capsule. The length of embryonic development is highly variable. It goes from just a few days to more than a year. And this process depends on the size of the egg, but also on the temperature. In fact, smaller eggs in warm water 
will develop way faster than bigger eggs in colder water. Unlike other mollusks, cephalopods do not have a true larval phase. Instead, the hatchlings really look like tiny and cute adults. Those guys, they grow fast and they die young. This strategy, coupled with their developmental plasticity, might be how they adapt faster and better than other animal groups. That's it for today. I hope you enjoyed the video and if you did, please like it, share it. You can also subscribe and hit that notification button very hard. I just created an Instagram account for the YouTube channel, so you can go and follow me if you want. Please do it. If you want to support the channel, you can also become one of my beloved patrons on Patreon. Otherwise, you can just go and do some shopping on my online store. I just created some cool designs, like a very cute tardigrade in space and a demon inside a broken ribcage. Pretty cool. I hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you next time for another episode of Krakenology.